my name is Joe Smith. I'm the director here. And it's a huge pleasure to introduce uh, an evening of plastic fun. So uh, you're all, I think, uh, here because you've had a spark um, lit either by the brilliant program that Liz fronted or by the wider ripples of public engagement um, in this massively important topic. But before we get to that, I just want to tell you a bit about where you are, because I know that only a portion of you are members or fellows of the society. Um, I should say yet. Uh, so I don't know. I've just got a couple of membership forms. Uh, <laughs> young geographer, the perfect Christmas gift. Uh, membership, the greatest gift you can give to yourself. Um, I'm available to sign those forms if that's helpful at all. Um, but I should probably tell you a bit about what you'd get. So um, the things that keep me awake at night since May are the fact that we've got a million maps and a million objects underneath our feet that relate to geographical science and expeditioning. It's an extraordinary collection. And the team do a brilliant job of bringing that out and expressing um, that in uh, shows and events um, that members and fellows participate in. There's also the Monday Night Lecture Series, um, which is, I think, a brilliantly programmed uh, mixed, healthy mixed diet of geography, um, travel with purpose, um, great issues of the day like tonight. Um, and uh, we also are, at core, a scholarly society. So we publish five journals and we have an annual academic conference but that connects directly in a way that no other scholarly society does with the curriculum. And we support teachers and students all over the country and indeed all over the world um, with some great materials. So um, I'm really proud to uh, look after a society that has such reach and uh, holds such heavy responsibilities. Um, but uh, tonight we've got a very focused topic um, far-reaching but focused, which is plastics. And um, we are going to be guided, and in a moment I'm looking forward to you joining me in welcoming uh, presenter Liz Bonin. Uh, but just to set this off, I just wanted to offer a, a provocative thought about plastic. So, I don't know, this summer, I don't know how many of you saw the Christo sculpture, the Mastaba, somehow well-made well-made name, um, that appeared on Hyde Park uh, on the Serpentine. Um, immense tons of steel and um, uh, buckets of acrylic paint went into making this, um, this major intervention in our urban space. And the Serpentine, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Um, the uh, gallery that uh, hosted the celebration, uh, launch celebration, were proud of the fact that they moved off uh, plastic straws uh, for the cocktails that celebrated this great enormous chunk of material resource that floated on Hyde Park for a couple of months. We have to get more critical and imaginative about how we use material goods and that has to move quickly beyond uh, being a bit anxious about plastic straws. But a couple more provocative thoughts before we go. When my grandmother was born in 1910 um, plastic wasn't really known. As she grew um, into early adulthood, um, plastic was truly fantastic. She has a wedding present, which is a, a Bakelite vacuum flask, and I still use it. I have it at home. And uh, that's one way in which, if we get this right, we can allow plastic to be properly fantastic. Um, Thinking of my uh, grandmother, she would want me to move off the stage quickly to the people you really come to listen to. So I'm going to ask you to join me in welcoming Liz. Thank you very much. Well, that's the wrong slide. That's a good start. Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Royal Geographical Society. Uh, I am delighted to be here and to see that uh, this event sold out. Um, as you probably know, I spent the best part of a year researching uh, the issue of the ocean plastic crisis. Um, and I have to admit, I completely underestimated 
the scale of the problem, how bad the situation had got ever since scientists began to flag up back in the 70s that we might be having a problem with plastics and our oceans. And so, as an individual, I've just felt compelled to find out more about the obstacles that prevail and what I, as an individual, can do to uh, help to truly be part of the solutions that are so desperately needed. And um, that's why, as uh, this evening, I've decided to uh, share a little bit with, uh, about what I learned with you, and then, uh, thanks to our esteemed panelists who have kindly agreed to join us this evening, share some answers to the questions that I still had when I finished uh, that journey. Uh, plastic is everywhere uh, in our oceans. It's reached every corner of our blue planet, and it seems every animal that it makes the sea its home. Uh, in the middle of the Tasman Sea, uh, flesh-footed shearwaters are picking off bits of plastic in the water column and feeding this plastic to their chicks that are in the burrows back on Lord Howe Island. And after three months of remaining in their burrows in the middle of the night in April, these chicks have this incredible instinct to just get out there and embark on their maiden migration to the Sea of Japan. But there's a problem. Their bellies are full of plastic. So for three weeks, every single night, a team of scientists led by Jennifer Lavers collect these chicks as they emerge from their burrows and they carry out this procedure called a lavage where they flush out the chick's stomachs with sterile seawater. And we joined the scientists for three nights and every single chick that was collected that night had plastic uh, coming out of its stomach. Uh, on average, we found about 30 to 40 pieces. Uh, two or three of them had about 90 to 100 pieces in a three-month-old chick. Um, it was quite a harrowing experience and yet these scientists carry on this incredible work with very little funding and very little support uh, for th uh, three weeks. Uh, Jennifer tells me that over the 12 years that they have been carrying out this procedure, every single season, they have found the average amount of plastic coming out of these stomachs to have increased from five to 10 pieces on average to 30 to 40 to 50 pieces. Now, of the chicks they can't manage to collect as they emerge from their burrows, the next morning they, they do sweeps on the beaches and they find dead chicks on the beaches. Uh, when I joined Jennifer the following morning, um, we found four chicks spread out uh, uh, in a very small cove. Um, what it basically boils down to is of the chicks that are able to sort of set off towards the sea in the middle of the night, they simply don't have the energy to take off past the surf and embark on this epic migration. Their bellies are too full of plastic, weighing them down, and they just don't have enough energy. Um, they bring these chicks back into the lab, they carry out post-mortems. The highest number they found so far is 280 pieces of plastic in one of the chicks, that equates to a human being having 10 kilograms of plastic in uh, their stomachs. Uh, as if that wasn't bad enough, the damage that's caused by this plastic isn't just what you see when you have to uh, unpleasantly post-mortem a shear water. Uh, plastics are made with a lot of chemicals in them. They absorb, adsorb chemicals in the environment, like heavy metals and persistent organic pollutants. And these chemicals are known to be what's called um, endocrine disruptors. They affect the hormones of these animals. So their reproduction is affected, their growth is affected. Uh, some of the heavy metals that plastic attract in the environment act as neurotoxins. And so the next stage of Jennifer's research is to find out how much is too much. You might see a shearwater chick successfully taking off over the surf. And yet, if it has one, two, three pieces of plastic in its stomach, potentially it's never going to be able to breed or grow properly, or eventually it might succumb to that plastic. We uh, set off on another expedition uh, led by the wonderful Amy Lusher, who some of us know here tonight. Um, Amy is studying how microplastics are affecting the food web uh, in the Arctic. Microplastics are pieces of plastic that are categorized as about a millimeter in size or smaller. And they break up because of the UV light that's hitting the plastic as it floats on the surface of the water. They get very brittle. And then the mechanical action of the waves breaking on the beaches breaks up that plastic. But in the Arctic, it's so cold. And every season when the ice 
freezes and then thaws, it sort of hoovers up huge amounts of plastic, breaks it up and then dumps it in the sea in one fell swoop. So it's thought that there's more microplastics or at least one of the highest concentrations of microplastics in the Arctic uh, than anywhere else. Uh, so science has already shown that zooplankton at the very bottom of this incredibly important food web are ingesting microplastics. Research has also shown that mussels that filter feed this zooplankton through the water have microplastics in them. And as a result of this trip with Amy Lusher, we found microplastics in the feces of walruses. So microplastics are moving from zooplankton up to mussels, up to walruses. It's also been shown that other animals like mackerel and seals contain microplastics in their system. So ultimately, microplastics have infiltrated the food web. And as it moves up the food chain, it bioaccumulates. And you're going from zooplankton to fish to seals to polar bears, or from zooplankton to fish to humans. And the repercussions of, of this knowledge and what it's doing to the food web could be catastrophic. And what really sort of I, I went away with from that trip was that we're only just beginning to uncover how prevalent microplastics are and what they might be doing, not least because of the chemicals found in plastics and on them. And yet for decades, animals in our seas have been taking up all of this plastic. It's quite a sobering thought. Uh, the full scope of the destructive power of plastic is unfortunately only still being unraveled. In the Coral Triangle in Southeast Asia, home to half of the world's coral reefs, an incredibly important ecosystem, an incredibly fragile ecosystem that's already straining under the pressures of uh, human, the modern world, our human impact, uh, not least because of, of warming sea temperatures. Um, Something very interesting is happening to these reefs, and Jolie Lamb and her team have been studying this for a few years. Uh, we uh, dived with her um, around the coral reefs um, off Sulawesi, and we found plastic everywhere, covering all this dead coral. It doesn't really, it's not what you expect when you're going diving in Indonesia. It's not the tropical, magical scene you expect. There are big bits of, of fishing nets and plastic sacks and bottles and sachets everywhere. And this plastic, as it settles on the coral, is not only stressing the coral because it's obstructing its growth, it's also blocking out sunlight, so the algae on the corals can't photosynthesize and give the energy to the corals. It's blocking out oxygen and potentially leaching its toxic chemicals onto the corals. But Jolie has found out that there is another threat to this. Plastics also act as little, tiny, disease-carrying rafts. Because of the texture of plastic, all the nooks and crannies, bacteria that is normally found in the water column and normally doesn't cause any harm is able to concentrate and proliferate on these little rafts. And as the plastic settles, it delivers this potentially toxic dose of bacteria onto the coral. And we tested some of these plastics for bacteria that are known to cause disease in corals. And we found the toxin from a particular group of, of uh, bacteria called Vibrio. And what Vibrio does is it, it, it sort of moves across the coral as it kills the coral, leaving a, a band of white dead tissue in its wake, a bit like gangrene spreading over skin. Jolie has to date studied 125,000 corals, and she has found that when there's plastic present on the coral reefs, the uh, likelihood of disease increases from 4% to 89%. Uh, this discovery really drives home just in how many ways plastic can, can impact our oceans, doesn't it? Now, when it comes to the sheer volume of plastic, it gets a bit more cheerful, by the way, in a minute. Just <laughs> bear with me. When it comes to the uh, sheer volume of uh, plastic entering our oceans, uh, a garbage a truck load of plastic enters it every single minute. So that equates to about 8 million tons every single year into our oceans. Half of that is estimated to come from our rivers. And of the 10 most highly polluting rivers in the world, eight of them are in Asia. So we decided to take a look at the Chitterim on the island of Java in Indonesia. And this is what we found. Uh, rafts, a uh, mile long of plastic waste flowing down the river. Um, and uh, they're often stretching from bank to bank. There are fish species that are renowned for being filter feeders, so they're known to, to clean, their function is to clean the rivers. They were all floating belly up on the banks of the river. Um, 
Every day we were told by one of the conservationists there that about 2,000 tons of plastic flows down the Chitterim, just one river in Indonesia. The river is now uh, a place where fishermen who used to fish for their livelihoods, um, now they're, they're picking bits of filthy plastic out of the mess to try and sell that to make a living because fish populations have plummeted by 60% in the past 20 years. That was one of the hardest experiences I've ever had, uh, having to speak to those fishermen and, and, and find out about what they need to do to put food on the table. Um, if you trace back where all this plastic comes from, you quickly end up in the markets in all the villages around um, this island, but also other islands in Indonesia. Everything, food, clothing, uh, household products, everything, it's wrapped in, even books, it's, it, books are wrapped in a film of plastic. Um, and what, what's happening here, well, most noticeable of all, of course, are these sachets. There were thousands upon thousands of strips of sachets hanging in all these stalls that we visited. And, you know, the sachets are making uh, uh, these coveted goods affordable to those with very little income. And why shouldn't the people of Indonesia be able to enjoy the, the goods that we've enjoyed for decades here? That's not the issue here. The issue here is that after they use a sachet, they chuck it literally on the riverbank, which happens to be their backyard. In all the villages we visited, uh, we were told that the local governments tell them, just sort out your own waste, because we don't have any waste collection facilities or infrastructure, so good luck. So we spoke to uh, so many villagers who understand the problem, but have nowhere to put their plastic. And so the Chitterum banks become this massive rubbish dump. Now, it's not just Indonesia. Two billion people the world over don't have adequate waste management infrastructure. So it's a quarter of the world's population that's just chucking their plastic in their own backyard. Um, but the local governments are not the only ones being blamed here. The global brands that are supplying these sachets to countries where they know full well they're not able to recycle any of these sachets, they're not even able to collect them, are they responsible? And if so, should they invest in recycling these products properly. Now, there have been a lot of very public pledges to that end. Um, and in fact, one company also set up a, a pilot recycling plant on the island of Java and has talked about organizing a collection system. But we've been discussing that, haven't we, Sean? So far, the sachets are just being chucked in the backyard, which means the rivers are teeming with sachets, which, which means the oceans are still teeming with sachets. Now, in the meantime, uh, local villages are trying to take things into their own hands. They're organizing these little projects called garbage banks. So they, they give a, a very small financial uh, incentive to the villagers. They say, go out and collect some plastic. If I can sell it on, you can get a little bit of money. And then there's this huge chain, all these links in the chain, all different little companies that are trying to make a living from this filthy plastic. And we followed one chain to this collection center on the left where the truck is. And this collection center collects from about 600 different um, uh, garbage banks on the island of Sulawesi. It collects about five tons a day, I think. And uh, then another com then it sorts it out. And then another company will come and say, right, we'll take all your bottles off you. So we followed that truck to this warehouse. All those bags are just filled with plastic bottles. Those are not, they look a bit like soles of leather shoes, but they're all just flattened plastic bottles that are just spilling out of this warehouse. The warehouse holds 30 tons of plastic bottles. The owner of the warehouse tells me he simply can't cope with the ever-growing volume of bottles he's receiving. So here's the crux. He's compacting the bottles to sell them on to yet another company who's going to grind them up, and then that plastic will become lower grade plastic items like carpet backing or flower pots or outdoor furniture. So in fact, those bottles are not being recycled, they're being downcycled to lower grade plastic, which means that new, fresh, virgin plastic still has to come into the system to make more bottles and more bottles keep coming. Um, but if we think that this is Southeast Asia's problem, we are sadly mistaken. In the UK alone, we are only recycling 9% of our plastic. How much of that is actually downcycled? I'm going to ask our panelists in a, in a moment. 9% is downcycled. There's the answer. 9% is recycled. Actually, let me correct that. 9% is downcycled. Uh, of the rest, we send it to landfill, we incinerate it, and then we export a, a, a good chunk of it. And where do we export it to? Indonesia, a country with an 81% mis waste mismanagement rate. 
We also sell it to Vietnam and we sell it to Malaysia. In fact, since China closed its doors to our dirty plastic it refused to deal with anymore, Malaysia is now the main destination for British plastics. And uh, a recent investigation uh, revealed that a lot of our plastic is ending up in illegal dumps there, uh, along with plastic from France, uh, Germany, Spain, Ireland, Japan, Australia. Uh, I recognize those recycling bags, they're the ones I use. Um, so, uh, when you find out the level of corruption involved in this recycling myth, as not only I call it, I think we all call it that now, um, it really drives home how we and other developed countries rate when it comes to being plastic polluters. This is undoubtedly a global crisis. We're all responsible for the amount of plastic uh, pouring into the sea. And some predictions are that by 2025, there will be twice the amount of plastic in the oceans as there are today. Now remember, uh, did I mention that the sachet companies, some of them have uh, sort of pledged that they would make all of their sachets fully recyclable and compostable by 2025? Right. Does the ocean have that long? I'll leave it to you to answer that. Okay, a little bit of positive stuff now, <laughs> and there'll be more positivity from the panel, you better promise. Uh, as the scale of the plastic manufacturing juggernaut and the, and the global lack of proper waste management becomes apparent, people and organizations all around the world are taking matters into their own hands and doing everything they possibly can to try and stop that plastic from getting into the ocean. So everything from the army galvanizing a whole host of different organizations and schools and elders, even even village elders joined us one day to clean up some sections of the Chitterim. So we joined them for a couple of those cleaning efforts and as laudable as they were, it didn't make much difference, but they're still at it and that is really commendable. Um, you have inventors and engineers designing solutions to try and collect the plastic in the estuaries and ports and harbors before it makes its way out into the open sea. Everything from a small sea bin, basically a submerged bin with a hydraulic pump that filters the water through, collects the plastic, Bob's your uncle. It collects, each sea bin collects about one and a half kilos, but if you deploy seven in a harbor, you can make a difference. And then, of course, there's, there's bigger contraptions like um, the trash wheel in Baltimore. It runs on solar power and the, the flow of the, of the water. And uh, since it started turning uh, in 2014, it's collected one million plastic bottles, half a million plastic bags, and 11 million cigarette butts. Cigarette filters, by the way, are just completely full of plastic microfibers. So. Around the world, heroic, effort, uh, he heroic efforts are, are, are going ahead. There's also even, you know, the, the UK are real leaders when it comes to beach cleans. We have done some incredible work here. Um, so every time the plastic tide washes up, we get out there, we get our schools organized, NGOs, and it's, it's making some difference. Some of that plastic isn't uh, in the sea anymore. Um, even when it comes to the plastic that's far out at sea, there are individuals who are just trying to just get on with it and find solutions and not wait for legislation. Uh, a young individual called Boyan Slash, he's only 25, um, had an idea eight years ago when he was snorkeling in Greece, when he saw this plastic, I'm gonna do something, what, what can I do? So he got together a group of scientists and engineers, they're about 100 strong, and he designed, well, they designed and redesigned this long six meter uh, boom with a three meter skirt underneath it that is, uh, basically its aim is to collect as much plastic as it can as it moves with the currents, but also the wind and the waves. So it moves slightly faster than the plastic it follows and then it collects it and every now and then it can be put onto a ship and taken ashore. Um, he just didn't believe in the perceived wisdom that the plastic in the sea, we can't do anything about it. We've got to focus all of our funding and our attention on not getting any more plastic into the sea. And, and there's an argument for that because this does cost a lot of money, but I love the initiative. I love how inspiring he is and I love the way he thought, yes, but what if we got that big plastic out of the sea before it broke up into microplastics and started infiltrating the food web? That to me is, is incredibly laudable. Um, I also met, I have to talk about this guy, David Christian, he's such a, an incredible young man. He's also, he's 25, he's a young entrepreneur, he comes from Indonesia, and he saw the mess in his country and he decided with just two or three other individuals, right, what can we do? Let's think about this from a completely different angle. Let's make a different material. Let's try and solve this by, by getting rid of plastic and, and, and making wrapping, making packaging with something else. And so he's made this 
great material from seaweed. There's no chemicals in it. It's completely uh, biodegradable. It melts in hot water. If it's a coffee granule sachet, it'll just melt into the cup. It doesn't taste as seaweed. I tasted it. It tastes like coffee. Um, it also can wrap burgers. Arguably, that's the most nutritious thing, is the wrapper made of seaweed, not really the burger. Um, the shelf life of this stuff is, is two years. It's not going to replace all the plastic, but imagine how revolutionary this could be for the hotel industry and those stupid little soaps in plastic film and then in a plastic bottle, or all the fast food outlets that could replace their burger wrapping, because that's not, that's not just paper, that's paper lined with plastic, if they replace it with seaweed and then you just munch on the whole thing. I think he's extraordinary and I can't wait, I really can't wait to see um, what he achieves. There are questions about the seaweed farms and how they might affect coastal ecosystems, and that, that requires more research. But again, I want to celebrate people like that, and I, want, I hope that others, other young individuals, can be equally inspired to do, to do their bit. Um, so around the world, we have pub, the public, we have scientists, we have entrepreneurs, invent, investors, all embarking on these inspiring new ventures to clean up the oceans themselves. But here's the problem, the plastic keeps coming. Over 300 million tons of plastic are produced every year and that's set to increase to over 500 million tons by 2050. In the US alone, I talk about this stat a lot because it just really bugs me. In the US alone, fossil fuel companies are investing $180 billion in new plastic factories to increase production of the same old plastic by 40% in the next decade. Now in that, case, it's all down to the shale gas boom in America that's made uh, natural gas liquid very, very cheap. So they can make very, very cheap plastic. And so there's this boom in plastic production. They're shipping this raw material all across uh, America, but they're also shipping it to Europe and to China for all you know, new plastic factories there as well. Um, the truth is that 99% of the raw materials for plastic come from the fossil fuel industry. So we do have to question the fact that the same industry that's contributed uh, to the climate breakdown crisis is contributing to the ocean plastic crisis. So really what needs to be done, what can we all do, the public, which is what really this event is all about, um, which is what I want to know, what can we do what needs to happen to drastically reduce the, the amount of plastic produced and the amount of plastics consumed. Now, not, not all plastic is this evil material to be condemned. Some of it is incredibly important, incredibly vital, uh, medical equipment, for example, construction, but um, of all the plastic that's made, 40% of it is this packaging that we use once and we throw away. Now, in some parts of the world, notably here in the UK and in Scandinavia, the public have been incredible. They have rallied around, they have said, we're giving up straws, we're giving up takeaway cups, we're not gonna use plastic bags anymore, we don't want you know, uh, plastic toothbrushes, and hey, retailers, what are you doing? Let's really make a difference. My question is, um, if it's only happening in very few countries, if the rest of Europe actually, embarrassingly, is not really rallying around in the same way, can changing our behaviors here at home be enough to drastically reduce plastic consumption globally? And my other question is, has the onus been placed a little bit too unfairly and perhaps a little bit too conveniently on the public to sort this mess out? What responsibility does the plastics industry take for this indestructible material that it produces? For the plastic chemicals it, it puts into the plastic during manufacture that is being shown to threaten our own health, and never mind the health of the marine environment. Uh, what responsibility, responsibility does it take for the collection and proper reuse of this material that never goes away? What can we replace a lot of this plastic with? What, what will work? And what are our world leaders doing to help us prevent this disaster? We've had a plastic bag tax. Yes, it did make a difference. And there was a recent new tax with the budget that I want to discuss with the, with the panel because I don't understand how it's going to make a difference. Maybe I'm being naive. Um, and my question is as well, from a, from a world leader point of view, from a global standpoint, is this all a little bit too late? Uh, at a UN environmental uh, conference in Kenya last year, this. This problem and the scale of it was described as an ocean Armageddon. And after everything I've seen, number one, I can't sleep at night anymore. 
And number two, I have to agree. I cannot believe what we've let happen and the scale of the problem that is, that is apparent for all to see now beneath the surface. I can't look at the sea in the same way. It used to be the place I would escape to to recharge the batteries and breathe. Now all I see under the surface is this cesspool of plastic that's killing everything beneath the surface. So tonight I want to know how do we turn off the plastic tap? It seems to me that we need solutions on a, on a scale that matches the scale of this crisis. Do we have enough time for incremental change? Um, and the pledges, some pledges that have been accused of tokenism, I want to know how we can truly solve this and what I can do as an individual to make whatever needs to happen, happen. Which is why I've invited a, a team of experts to help me to better understand what needs to be done and to share the conversation with you tonight. So it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, our panel this evening. Uh, David Newman is founder of the Bio-Based and Biodegradable Industries Association UK. He's got 20 years of experience in, waste, in the waste management sector. He's collaborated with the UN's Environmental uh, Assembly, amongst others, and his mission is also to make the UK a centre of excellence for the production of innovative materials. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm announcing you in order of you know, how you're coming up, so it's a bit higgledy-piggledy, but bear with. Uh, Sean Sutherland is the co-founder of A Plastic Planet, a non-profit organisation working with global brands, retailers and governments to reduce the use of plastic packaging uh, for food and for drink, and to inform and empower the public so we can better understand where responsibilities lie. And then we have Professor Richard Thompson, Director of the Marine Institute at the University of Plymouth. Now, when I started researching this whole subject, I was told, you have to speak to the godfather of microplastic research. Uh, everybody calls you that. I don't, do you like that? Do you like that title? Not especially. <laughs> I love it. Um, now, Richard has been studying this area for uh, over 20 years uh, in the field of marine debris, marine biology. He's presented his research to governments around the world, and his work has also informed new UK legislation in this area, including the use of microbeads in cosmetics and the use of um, plastic bags. Um, and last but not least, Dr. Stephanie Wright, a research fellow with the Centre uh, for, for Environmental Health at King's College London. Stephanie is also a marine biologist. She's been studying microplastics in the marine environment before quickly moving on to studying airborne microplastics, their sources and potential impacts to human health, a very interesting area. So please would you welcome our panel this evening. We have a lot to get through as we were discussing, um, but we're all ready for proper rants and proper banter and we'll also be opening up um, questions to, uh, to the audience as well later on. Uh, Richard, if I can start with you, you're just back from Lanzarote, the microplastics conference there. Um, you've continued to work on this subject tirelessly ever, ever since you began over 20 years ago. What are you and your research teams focusing on now when it comes to better understanding where the gaps in our knowledge lie and how they can better inform the changes we so desperately need. So what, what inspired me to work on this topic, as I, and when I started training to be a marine biologist, I didn't imagine I was gonna spend you know, my career working in rubbish on beaches. It was the fact that it was arriving every day in the experiments that I was conducting as a PhD student that got me fascinated in it. And I realized that we were missing something when we do beach surveys, we we're missing the really small stuff, and that, set me a challenge when I started lecturing. I set some of my students a challenge. I said, forget about the big stuff. Go and find me the smallest bits. And, and that's where we really kind of discovered and characterized microplastics. So a lot of what we've been doing has been trying to understand how microplastics accumulate, what are the sources of microplastics, what are the effects of microplastics, how do we do something about them? Yeah. And it's that how do we do something about them that, that is actually another direction of my research. So whilst on the one hand I'm trying to understand the extent and the types of harm, on the other hand, you know, from a variety of different perspectives, we recognise there is agreement that plastics in the ocean are harmful, whether that's economic harm or harm to wildlife, threat to human health. So what the heck do we do about it? So increasingly I'm starting to work with social scientists and actually to work across the disciplines, because that's the key thing, I think, to fixing it. There's no silver bullet out there. It, it, it isn't about switching to paper or some wonderful material but it's about matching the evidence base to make sure, and I, 
I know I'm going on too long, but what I would say is no, after 25 not. years of working on the topic, there's never been a time quite like the present where almost all the ducks are aligned. We've got the public, policy makers, and industry all saying we need to do something about it. We've only, in my view, got this one shot at it. It's now, and the fundamental thing is we need to get it right. Because, you know, you alluded to, to the, well, no, I, it was an allusion to the straws earlier on. And yeah, of course, there's plastic bits we don't need in the first place. But on their own, they're not going to fix it. So while we've got this passion to do something about it, what we need is the evidence to make sure that we make the right decisions. Okay. And when it comes to evidence about microplastics, it seems to me it's still incredibly new. We know what the big pieces do. Yep. But when you start uncovering, and I'll come to you in a moment, Stephanie, the issue with, with toxic chemicals in and on plastics, and then you start talking about microplastics and even nanoplastics mm -hmm. that can cross cell boundaries, you're a scientist. I can't ask you what do you think might happen. You're going to wait for the evidence. But from your years of experience, what do you suspect we might discover? How much more serious is this going to get? I, what, I, what I would say there is when we... When we we, we first found microplastics in shorelines around the UK, and then we showed it had increased significantly over time, decade on decade. And then some of my students actually said, look, it's going to be in the creatures, isn't it? And I said, well, okay, but it could be like looking for a needle in a holy stack. It was Amy Lusher, who was a student of mine at the time you referred to as her earlier. Mm -hmm. She looked at 500 fish from the English Channel. We found microplastic in a third of all of the fish that we looked at. And to me, that was a real wake-up call. And it's not that that level, because there's only one or two pieces per fish. It's, it's not something that concerns me about eating fish, but for goodness sake, it's a wake-up call that we need to change our ways. So to me, the evidence from the ocean at the moment is, is catastrophic, but I, but I don't think it's terminal. I do think it's fixable, but we've got to change our ways because if we carry on contaminating the oceans at the current rate, then the levels that we're finding, and sure, in some wildlife, you, you, you looked at the birds, Jennifer Labor study, in some, in some creatures, it's already presenting a substantial problem. In others, we're kind of on the edge of that. So what I see is the really clear evidence that we need to change our ways. What the future is like is, is kind of speculation, but to me, it's apparent we've got to change our ways. Yeah. One of the areas I was, oh, how many areas was I shocked about, but one of the areas I was most shocked about was what do you mean plastics are also toxic and they've got chemicals in them at the point of manufacture, but also they absorb chemicals? Um, Stephanie, this is your area of research. Tell me, first of all, for the audience, just what are we talking about here with regards to uh, the plastics that are causing problems when plastic is made, but also the, pla or the, the toxins, I should say, when plastic is made, but also the chemicals it attracts and what they do to animals, what they can do to us? Sure. Um, so plastic, as you all are aware, it's a solid material. But if you zoom into micro, to plastics at the microscopic level, it's actually a matrix. And within that matrix sits uh, chemical additives that are incorporated at the time of manufacture. And because they're just sat nestled in the matrix, they're very susceptible to leaching out as well. And that can differ depending on the additive or the type of plastic and the environment. So when we think of plastic, it becomes this really complex. It's not just this solid material. It's a solid material plus its chemical burden. Now, with additives, we know they have health effects. So BPA is a really common plastic additive, and that's been uh, linked to um, health effects in people, such as uh, diabetes and um, coronary heart disease. So those are actually shown effects in epidemiological studies. Um, Phthalates are another additive, so they're incorporated in plastic to soften it and make it a flexible material, and they are highly susceptible to leaching out. And so, in terms of plastics, we're not just talking about plastic, but these harmful chemicals. Um, it's also hydrophobic, which means in the environment, it almost acts like a magnet and attracts other hydrophobic chemicals surrounding it. And these include things like organochlorine pesticides, DDT, you know, that's been found on the surface of plastics, um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which we know come from uh, the incomplete combustion of fossil fuels. And these are carcinogenic, mutagenic, can cause reproductive toxicity. And that's been shown in both uh, human and animal studies. Okay, you could argue, uh, until the science can really make the connection that there's a very big smoking gun here. Yeah. Um, not only because of the plastic we might be ingesting from the fish we eat, 
particularly if the nanoparticles can cross cell boundaries. So it's not just in the stomachs of fish, it's in the, the flesh of fish. But your uh, focus of, of research quickly turned mm. to another source of plastics, which to me was just mind blowing. Could you please sure. tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so, so my background is marine biology. And I actually did my PhD with Richard um, and Professor Tamara Galloway and it focused on the potential for microplastics to cause harm in the marine environment, and specifically in marine worms. Very, very glamorous. But, very glamorous. Um, <laughs> I spent four years looking at the harm um, microplastics could cause to marine worms. And during this time, it emerged that microplastics were also uh, popping up in seafood and, and things destined for human consumption. And so it just made me think, I'm here researching the harm microplastics are causing to animals, and now we're also becoming aware that we might be exposed. And so my interest naturally you know, turned to what that could mean for our health and, and you know, the impacts it might mean for us. Um, so I joined the Medical Research Council and Public Health in England funded Centre Environment and Health at King's College London uh, to start investigating this issue. And I joined the air pollution group. So naturally, again, I became interested in whether microplastics might be in the air. And actually, aside from food, we might also be exposed via inhalation. So past, for the past few years, I've actually been researching this issue. So are microplastics airborne? How small do they get? Are they small enough to be inhaled and enter our airway? And then how might that contribute to health effects we already know occur from, say, exposure to air pollution? And so what have you found when it comes to how much we could be exposed to from seafood, from the marine environment that we now are beginning to understand, okay, there's a problem with plastics there. If we ingest it, that's a problem. What have you found in comparison when it comes to airborne particles? Sure. So, I mean, this is also quite linked to you because I know yes. Richard was on a paper Chip recently. Um, so, Anna Caterino, uh, a colleague of Richard's, uh, published a paper that looked at... Uh, the concentration of microplastics you're exposed to during a seafood meal. And they actually found that you would be exposed to more microplastics from the dust and the fibers that deposit onto your meal during that time than what you'd actually get from the mussels themselves. So we're beginning to build up this picture that actually the air could be a substantial exposure pathway for us to microplastics. Right, <laughs> let that sink in for a moment. It's a very chirpy evening, isn't it? Um, yeah. When it comes to the types of microparticles, which ones are you most concerned about? Which ones do we need to tackle first? Because clearly plastic is everywhere. I started my talk with plastic is everywhere in our oceans. It's everywhere. It's in the air. It's, it's everywhere. Well, yeah. I mean, for me, and I know, uh, I think for Richard as well. So when we talk about microplastics in the environment, uh, you know, we think of them as secondary microplastics that are there through the breakdown of, of um, larger plastic products such as single-use packaging, bottles and bags, and that is one source. But actually, the most common source of, uh, or type of microplastic that we find in the environment, so in the ocean, in freshwater, and in the air, are plastic fibres. So these are plastic microfibres that actually come from synthetic textiles, not from a plastic bottle or a plastic bag. Um, so for me, my increasing awareness is towards textiles, you know, the carpet in this auditorium, the chairs you're sat on, the clothes you're wearing, the coat you'll put on, um, the carpet at home, you know. Synthetic materials. Exactly. So that's the area of your focus. So, yeah, at the moment. When it comes to, you know, when I was beginning to find all this out, I was thinking to myself, how do we still not know as much as we need to know about how these microfibers and mi microparticles are affecting us when it comes to human health. Why are we not further ahead with that topic, both of you? Yeah, well, I, I, I think we know as much as we need to know. I mean, I've had that very question put to me by, by policymakers sometimes when there's intransigence about doing something. And they've said to me, well, actually, if you don't know a lot yet about the effects of plastic and microplastic on human health, maybe we should wait, maybe we should delay before we take any action. And I'm kind of saying, well, there's already a substantial body of evidence about the, the large items of plastic and the effects that they have on wildlife, the economic effects that they have, uh, and the effects on human well-being. And there's considerable emerging evidence that the fragments that those large items break down to are harmful, as indeed are some of the fibers that are coming from, from where, from, from textiles and possibly from tires as well, from where in use. So, you know, the fact that we've got 
these question marks over some areas because it's a relatively new science. I mean, you know, the term microplastic was, you know, used, the first use of the term in this context was in a paper that I published in, 2004. in 2004. You know, yeah. it wasn't that long ago. We yeah. are still learning a lot about the potential impacts, the ways that those impacts might present. But I th what I would make a plea is that our uncertainty about effects on human health, our uncertainty about effects on wildlife, our uncertainty about effects of nanoparticles is not a reason to delay in taking action because we already know, and you've illustrated it very clearly in the program, about the harmful effects of plastic in general. So, so th there's a clear call to arms to me for us to take there action is, there while is, uh, we continue with the science. But as an individual, I have two questions about why is the science still new? I'm not blaming the scientist here. I know there's a funding issue, but please discuss that with me now. And then sort of, we found uh, plastic particles in uh, human stools now, mm -hmm. right? That's been done. There's the, the latest research was a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, you know. Yeah. What else do we need? Why is it, oh, uh, why is it so slow? I guess like, in combination with what Richard said, this started as a marine issue. Yeah. So our research efforts have been focused on marine environments and you know across the globe. It's only the last few years really that we've become aware that they contaminate <coughs> foods, that they, you know, it's just even though scientists were flagging this issue up back in the 70s. Is, it, is this an issue of yeah. world leaders, governments, whatever you want to call it, not supporting scientific research enough because in a way, well, it's the marine environment, it's not us, it doesn't really threaten us. Is there an element of that to this? Because I can't understand sort I, of... I would say part of it is if you look at the, the production curve for plastics and you think in, in 1950 we were producing about 5 million tonnes of plastic globally. Today we're producing in excess of 300 million tonnes and 40% of that is single-use items that are rapidly going to waste. So the curve is like that and there's no sign of it levelling off. And, and, and why is that relevant? It's relevant because the quantities, you put the statistic earlier on that, you know, between 2015 and 2025, there could be a tripling of the amount of plastic in the oceans. So, so it's been accumulating there over time, but the rate of accumulation is increasing almost exponentially associated with our increasing use and the fact that most of that use is single use, which is rapidly accumulating as waste. So the, the, the problem that's kind of been there in the background for decades is really kind of coming home to roost now because of the quantities, because of the global extent of right. production. Right. So we know how much damage it's causing to the marine environment. We're beginning to get an idea of what it could be causing to, to for human health, the causes of to human health. How do we begin to deal with uh, so much of this material in the environment? And one of the most surprising areas, again, when it comes to why there's so much of it, and is the recycling issue, which suddenly became the recycling myth to me and then everybody was talking about it in that way. David, can I ask you, why is it that globally we only recycle, downcycle slash downcycle, 11% of our plastic, and in the UK we only recycle slash downcycle 9% of our plastic? Why are we not recycling more? Well, firstly, I want to assure the audience that my trousers are made of wool, my shirt mm -hmm. is made of cotton, <laughs> and I'm not polluting. Uh, but it's terrifying to think that sitting there <laughs> We are it is. We're breathing, we're breathing in. Our, we're and also, breathing my in. tights are contributing. Oof. I'm so um, sorry. <laughs> Shame. Now, how can I how can I ask, answer your question? Yes. What are you looking at there? Plastic. Look at it again. What are you looking at there? Tell me, David. You're looking at negative value. You're looking at something which is worth less than zero. To who? to even the poorest people in the world that you went and visited in Indonesia, which is why they throw it in the river. Why? Why does it have it negative value? It is worth value? less than zero because even when it's a brand new product, it's as cheap as hell, and that's why it's so successful. It's lightweight, it's durable, and it costs very little. So imagine how much the value of its waste is. It's negative. What you're looking at there is negative value. And as it's negative value, it's of no interest to anybody to collect it, which is why around the world nobody does. So are you saying that basically the plastics industry, the recycling industry, looks at that and says, it's cheaper for me to make new stuff than to spend money collecting that, cleaning it, and recycling it? Yes, is that sir. what it all boils down to? Yes, sir. And the only reason that we do in some parts of the world collect it, clean it, and recycle it is because we pay a shed load of money to do that. 
We have deposit return schemes. My wife and I were in Finland recently. There's not a plastic bottle to be seen anywhere because on every plastic bottle is written, this plastic bottle is worth 15, 20, 30, 40 cents. And they collect every one of them. Uh, we have extended producer responsibility schemes in Europe and other parts of the world where the producers pay shed loads of money to make sure that the councils and the operators go out and collect it. In the UK, we pay around about 7 to 10 percent of what the Germans pay. And, the, and you won't see these littering problems in a lot of those countries. Well, but elsewhere around the world, for example, in Indonesia or wherever, there's no such levy on industry. There's no such payment to make it worthwhile for even the poorest people in the world to go and collect that. That raises huge issues with respect to the responsibility of industry when it comes to a crisis that is so apparent and becoming very serious. Every, every week or so, there's more research that just causes even more calls for concern, right? It's that, that, not just industry, it's also governments, because industry yeah. influences governments, politicians are weak, and as, as Richard said, politicians also are hesitant to take action. The industry saying, we will lose jobs. The, the, the British Plastics Federation, ladies and gentlemen, wrote a letter to the Prime Minister saying, taxing plastics is not the way forward. Really? <laughs> they should be ashamed of themselves, well, let's, because let's... taxing plastics is the way forward, because then you can get the money to make sure that it has a value. There are a lot of reports that you read and you're trying to kind of sift through it and make sense of it. For example, I read reports that, you know, recycling can't be the solution because there's just so much plastic out there. We simply can't keep up with the plastic. So we have to just look away from recycling, you know, not, that's not part of the solution. How are you supposed I'm talking, to... I'm talking about just collecting it, Liz. Yeah. Just keeping it in a safe place so that it doesn't wash down into the rivers. Then we can decide whether we want to recycle it. Turn it off Ultimately, taking responsibility for collecting it and, and reusing it, it properly. Landfill it, burn it, whatever. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's interesting that on the slide you put up, one of the slides you put up about the steps you could do as an individual to stop ocean plastic. I was, I, I was pretty staggered that disposing of plastic properly at the end of its lifetime wasn't on there. I mean, you know. Plastics do have benefits. Although I'm a marine biologist and I hate to see the negatives, they do have benefits to society, whether that's applications in schools, in hospitals, whether it's, a, it's reducing food wastage. There are benefits of plastic. But if, if you think about damage to the environment, most of the challenges that I face as a marine biologist, the damage to the environment is directly caused by something us humans want, whether that's taking fish out of the sea, and the practices of taking them out, or whether it's the fact that we all want to live and take holidays by the coast that takes natural habitat away, or whether it's the carbon emissions from an aeroplane or a car that might have gotten me here, that most of the challenges, the environmental challenges that we face, are directly coupled to, to a benefit that society wants. So the benefit that society wants causes the damage. Now, if you think about the benefits of plastic, and there are some, they're not directly linked to this emission. What I'm saying is we could have the benefit of plastic, and it is about the value that David alluded to, without there being an emission to the environment. It isn't compulsory, if you use plastic, that it will go in the sea. That's about how you deal with it and how you I interact think. it, and how we value plastics. And particularly if we're bringing in industry, I would say it's in part, in order to ensure there's value there at end of life, it's about responsible design. I certainly think there are a lot of plastic products out there that we didn't need in the first place. But I think there are some that we do need. And actually, they're the best way of doing things. And with those products, we need to be absolutely certain that we're designing them in the best possible way that will minimize the environmental side effects, the okay. unintended consequences. Well, let's clarify that, because it's a very complex issue. And there's a, there's a few things I want to clarify so that we, we're all sort of on the same page. First of all, with regards to the design of it, what is it about plastic that makes it so expensive to recycle? You know, why, what, what is it? Why can't you just make a packaging into new packaging? Why, why does it cost more, and therefore well, because don't bother just make new stuff? What, be, because uh, generally speaking, you will find that plastics are made of, of diverse type of polymers, yeah. okay, and it's very difficult to se separate them out, and when and and, and, and you, you generally can't. So it's, it's difficult to get back into polymer types. Uh, secondly, plastics are contaminated. They're stuck to food, they're stuck to paper, they're stuck to aluminium. It's very, very difficult uh, to, to, to separate them. Um, they're stuck to pizza. You know, pizza, a pizza will stick to your plastic, your sandwich will stick to your plastic. Um, it, that plastic is useless. But above all, it's because it's so cheap. Can we make plastic in such a way that makes it easily recyclable, putting away the, the dirty pizza 
cheese on it for a moment, putting that to the side. When Can we? Yeah. What, yeah. Was the, what was the brief when, when the plastics industry set off to make this wonder material? Well, Why is it not recyclable? That's, that's the it's problem, that the end of life was never in the brief. The things, and, I, and, and you know, I asked this question of, of, of the designers, and, and I say, end of life, and they say, what do you mean end of life? It was never in the brief. It was about a, making a product to do its purpose, and also making it attractive so that we buy it, making yeah. it look good. End of life was not there. And so it doesn't surprise me that as a consequence of that, we've got a whole host of things that we can't deal with at yeah. end of life. I, I went and saw an advert from the 1960s and it was the family yeah. having their dinner and literally in the advert, they were throwing, it, they were throwing yeah. all these plastic plates away. Mum didn't have to wash up anymore. Well, it's convenient. It was so convenient. It's convenient, but also we didn't know. Just we didn't, didn't we actually hadn't even thought about it. I mean, even now we're saying plastic's going to be in the, in the environment for 500 plus years. We don't even know if it's 500 plus years. How can we ever know that? Yeah. You know, we're making all these suppositions. We didn't know. When we first invented plastic, it was originally to replace the billiard ball. Okay, so, so that it wasn't going to be for, you know, made out yeah, of ivory yeah, anymore. It was lightweight, it was, hurrah. Yeah, it, it's a miracle material. It How is, incredible we invented It is still a miracle this. material, but clearly there's so much to tackle. So let's just get this clear. We know that plastic is too expensive to recycle because of the way it's made. So we need to take a long, hard well, not, look. I say we have some, it's it's some of it, some of it. So this, this, this so yeah. single use that we're going to focus on that could really be eliminated from this, this mess. The other part of this, of course, is, okay, so it's made in such a way that makes it really complicated to, to it's expensive to recycle properly. So let's just downcycle it and keep on it's putting new plastic. It's designed in that way, yes. which creates problems. Fine. Yeah. So then the other side of that is, when, I'll put it to you this way, when China closed its doors to our plastic and said, we're not recycling your dirty, not sorted plastic, and anyway, we're trying to pull up our socks and clean up our acts, we're gonna deal with our own. What gobsmacked me was that the UK then sort of was like, the reports I read was like, oh, poor us, what are we gonna do with our plastic? Oh, we're in such a pickle. Uh, where are we gonna sell it to now? I don't know, what are we gonna do? And then, oh, I know, Viet you know, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, let's do it. I was so shocked and horrified at that. Mm -hmm. Because not only is, okay, there's a, there's a design issue here that we need to take a long, hard look at, but also, even when China decided not to buy our stuff anymore, we're not res taking responsibility for correctly correcting, collecting our plastic. What needs to happen, David? What do we need to do uh, in the UK, for example? What would be a, a good scenario for taking responsibility for our plastic waste here? Uh, there's, 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 there's no silver bullet, but there's several things we can do. Firstly, we've got to really reduce the amount of plastic packaging we use. I mean, it, it, we have to dramatically work on I just mean it. on the collection end, because we're going to ah, get into... On the collection end, we have to fund proper collections. We propose with Plastic Planet to the Chancellor that a 10p a kilo tax is put on plastic packaging so that that creates a roughly about a 300 million pounds a year fund to actually make sure that that doesn't end up in a river, a stream, or a field anywhere, that it's actually collected, that you can put a value on it and people will want to get that value back. Was it Tesco CEO who said the UK's waste management system is unfit for purpose? Correct, he wrote to me that. And you know, when that comes from people who are the biggest retailers in the country, you get an idea of the problem we've got. We don't have the money in, in the waste industry and in the collection systems, <laughs> in the recycling systems to make that pay. That's what we need, first of all, money. Right, where's that money coming from, David? It's gotta come from the plastics industry who will pass it on to you, the consumers, when you buy your plastic bottle, you'll pay a 10p charge or a 15p charge Do and you'll get that back. Do they have to pass it on to us? Or, yeah, or maybe it could be a tax which is at source which acts as a deterrent for using this material as the default material in the Why first place. Why should we pay for an issue which was exactly our issue with the treasurer exactly. when, when we'll, we met and, with the and treasurer. And we'll get to that. Yeah, you, but yeah. so you can put a tax on the virgin polymers. We propose that. Mm. Um, but you, you need money. And you okay. Need money Somebody to needs to pay for it, and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll get to that. And right now, I don't know any other industry that you can pump something as dangerous as plastic out and have no responsibility for what happens to it after. Mm. I can't think of another industry where so that we're, happens. So we're slowly making our way to responsibility in industry, but first I want to ask you about... I'm bored when of not it talking. Comes to, sorry? <laughs> I'm bored of not talking. Oh no, you're... Oh, poor Sean is not used to not talking, everyone. I've kind of saved her for, for the, the best of that. No, but, um, 
I want to uh, talk about, when it comes to the plastic industry taking responsibility, these uh, very public anti-litter campaigns. Yes, we're responsible. We're going to fund anti-litter campaigns, and we're going to work with NGOs. And mm. Sean, tell me about your thoughts about that. David is puffing air and <laughs> looking. You know, let's discuss Don't that you, a little you bit. We need a Newman rant. They have a Newman rant. Do we want a, Okay, we'll do a Newman rant, and Sean, I'll come to you. I promise. <laughs> okay. I'm coming to you very soon. Right, one minute Go. rant. <laughs> one minute rant. The multinationals, the corporations throughout the world, want to deflect the attention from their own responsibility, both legal and financial. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they deflect the attention to your responsibility, to littering, to the, your behavior as consumers. You don't put it in the right bucket. You don't put it in the right bin. It's your fault. Therefore, they finance all the littering campaigns. Who finance Keep America Beautiful? The great anti-litter campaign. Yeah, Coca-Cola. There you go, Coca-Cola. They financed it. Okay, so it's about deflecting yeah. the attention from their responsibility, both legal and financial. Okay, yeah. so then, great round, very concise, I'm impressed. <laughs> um, tell me about where in the world, Finland, um, you know, what countries are leading by example? You know, uh, giving an example of how the industry plays a part in taking responsibility, the plastic is collected properly, it's recycled, is there such a thing? Can we actually recycle any plastic? What, what country is leading by example you know, in that um, regard? Firstly, let's take, let's take the, the, the three steps, money. There's a law in Europe, and the law has just been revised, which says that between 80 and 100% of all the costs of collection and recycling of packaging waste must be paid by the industry by, I think, 2021, 2022. That's coming in. Um, there are countries who already do that. Uh, Germany, Spain, France, Italy, the Scandinavian countries, they already have far, far more money in the system than the UK has, okay? So there are examples of, of countries that are doing the financial part of it well. Secondly, uh, the collection systems. Collection systems vary throughout the world. There's some people do it well, some people do it less well, but generally speaking, in mainland Western Europe, they do it reasonably well. There's not a lot of plastic leaking into the environment. Thirdly, recycling. There's hardly any real recycling, material to material, going on anywhere. Those plastic bottles you see are probably about the only stream, which if you do separately collect them, you can recycle back into plastic bottles. Tell me about that. This, this deposit return scheme, PET well, bottles, if, if how you, does that work? Whatever, whether you get them through deposit return schemes, whether you get them through source segregated collections at shops or your houses, it's a single polymer. It's, it's reasonably easy to recycle. That can be recycled and is being recycled in a limited way back into bottles. It, where is but it being recycled? not one bottle becoming another bottle. Yes. Uh, a part to a of certain extent. Part of with more virgin polymer. It can happen. Yeah. It can happen. I thought Finland was doing that. Finland, Scandinavia, the Germans, but it's it's but it's a small part of Europe. Why can't plastics. they? Why is the UK doing that? I'm hearing rumours for a, a year, two, three years. I don't know. Oh, we're going to have bottle deposit return schemes here, and, and are we going to do that here? Could we even start with that? Well, Wouldn't Scotland, that make a Scotland change? Scotland has started with a deposit, starting with a deposit return scheme, so we're on the way. Um, the English government is looking at it, and maybe it will be introduced into new laws. Okay, looking at it and discussing is is what really gets um, my blood boiling when yeah. I've seen what well, I've seen. Which there's a lot of me, opposition to which it. Which brings me beautifully mm -hmm. to the budget. Sean, would you like, have you all consulted on this in some way? Uh, it, it, the, the, the result that uh, with the last budget, mm -hmm. you will be taxed as a plastic, plastic manufacturer if your plastic has less than 30% recycled plastic in it. So, if I'm a plastic uh, manufacturing company, I'm going to make plastic with 31%, avoid the tax, the rest of the plastic is going to be virgin plastic. I don't get it, Sean. Yeah. Explain it to me. I, I agree. It's flawed. It's too slow. It's all of those things. It's imperfect. But if you imagine when we actually went into the Treasurer 10 days before the budget, thinking how can we influence the budget in some way, knowing that he was probably thinking what I'm going to do is the crowd pleaser, which is I'm going to slap a tax on the coffee cup because everybody's talking about these coffee cups. But it makes no sense to us to tax a coffee cup and not tax the plastic bottle that you're selling next to it. So to actually do something which is, to be honest, it's the, it's the first step on a long path, but it is the first government, I believe, worldwide, that is even considering taxing plastic. So it's a big, it's a big gesture it's to a new gesture. way of thinking. However, it's compromised, exactly as you say. But trust me, if every drinks bottle had to have 30% recycled content, Imagine this, one year's production of drinks bottles goes halfway to the sun. 
That's how many bottles we pump out. Coca-Cola alone, 110 billion bottles but a how year. How does this change? There isn't enough recycled content. They won't get enough plastic in order to suddenly replace all of those. So it will have some influence. Okay. Perhaps it will give you a, li a little bit more value to these bottles on Tell the beach. Tell me about the time frame, because there's still a lot of consulting to happen on this. Oh How my much God. is the tax? A year. A, a year, because did, well, did I read 2022? 20, 2022, a year yeah, a year oh, before yeah. you get the law, another year before it comes yeah. into force. You know, so it, by 2022, it will have been decided how much it will be taxed and what else needs to be decided. How much money will be, uh, something like 370 million could be raised if it was taxed out. If, if it was as simple as that, 10p on a kilo of virgin yes. plastic, that would raise 370 and million. And where would that money go? And that money could be ring-fenced very well and could then build infrastructure because That's what, what everybody would like tell you. to see happen. Yeah. What do you presume they're going to decide to do with the money raised? Because it's the plastic industry being tar taxed at source, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't make this with, see, for me, I just think you're all going to make it with 31%. Recycle plastic and you're fine. You're not going to be taxed. But th was, that's 30% more than now. Companies. Is it not just for food and beverage it is, packaging? Isn't it? Isn't it? It's it not is. Like any it's a package, use, it's just package, package packaging yeah. and the import of plastic packaging. What, what do mm. you think are the, is the likelihood that that money raised could go to compostable facilities, to better recycling facilities, or could it actually be used for something completely unrelated to this well, problem? This, this is the danger because the, the landfill tax, which was introduced many years ago, actually pays the National Health Service today. It doesn't pay recycling at all. So, you so know, it has, to be, it has to be ring-fenced. Still ideal, a lot to be consulted upon. The ideal would be that you ring-fence that tax and you use it to, as a multiplier to help to move towards solutions. And that's the, the, the same... You know, it was the same comment that was made over the plastic bag tax, the single-use plastic bag tax. And it's lovely that it goes to charities, but actually we need investment in helping to fix the problem. Mm. And I don't just mean clean up. We need investment in, in technology and in infrastructure uh, and in advancing things. But, I mean, to come back to your plastic bottles, you, you know, you hit the nail on the head earlier on that one of the challenges is the diversity of different polymers. That means that it's a bit like if you can picture... Your, your, one of your children doing their first experiment with powder paints at home and what they do is they get all the colours and they mix them up and you end up with black. We've, got, we've ended up with such a diversity of polymers it makes it immensely challenging to recycle. And so one of the things that we could do to help ensure that there's value and that it, it's, there's efficient scale is to reduce the diversity of polymers that are used in, in everyday single-use applications, because that, that will make it more compatible with a closed loop, with the bottle-to-bottle -bottle aspiration that you're talking about. If I, if, if I were to take an, a, a group of recyclers down to the local supermarket, they would instantly identify some of the PET bottles in that picture that they could readily recycle and turn into a new bottle. But they would point to another one and say, well, I would be challenged to do that. And often the things that their bottles they would pick on, even though it's the same polymer, is they would reject the bottles that have got a colouring put in it. You picture a green lemonade bottle. Mm. They wouldn't want that because the presence of the green colouring halves the value to them in recycling. Now, the only reason the green pigment is there is because it's there as a marketing tool to, dip, to brand differentiate certain brand of lemonade. So my point is, it, it's, it's some of this is a lack of thought at the design stage. It's not deliberate, but as a consequence of not thinking about end of life, We've got thousands of different polymer permutations that mean it's very challenging to recycle effectively. And in some cases, we've taken polymer that could be highly recyclable and we've rendered it unrecyclable by adding things like colorants so, uh, to it, by adding complexity to it. So we need to simplify what we're doing. And I, and I actually think that, that having an incentive for recycled content, because if I, again, if I talk to the recyclers, one of the things that's really challenging for them is consistency. It's consistency in supply, which is the mixture, but it's also consistency in demand. Because if you imagine that the price of recyclate leaving the factory is constant, that's set by the people that might buy it against the price of oil. And we know the price of oil does this. So when the price of oil is really high, it makes it very difficult to sell, sell, the, sell the, you know, it makes it easier to sell the recycled product. If the price of oil comes down, you can't sell the recycled product. So actually having something that compels recycled content isn't in itself a bad thing but it's not going to fix it on okay, its own. Okay, I hear you. I, I, I presume you're beginning to understand, to get a proper grasp of how complicated yeah. this is. And I wonder um, if there's an easier way. 
Is there an easier way? Can well, we just use less of it in the first place? We, well, there is a bit of that, isn't there? Before you move on to retailers, I really want, because you were doing some very exciting um, um, things with retailers um, that I know our audience is going to want to know about. You know, again, speaking as an individual, why couldn't we have just banned anything that isn't 100% recycled? And question number two, Costa Rica's planning to ban all single-use packaging by 2021. Why on earth can't we do that? As a leading developed country, yeah. I, there is no time left. I can see, you know, I've seen it. With every cell in my body, I know there's no time left. You all know that. Why couldn't we just do that? Money. Is that too simple a question? Yeah. Again, it comes down to this bloody money thing, doesn't it? Because you know, it, it is 100% the influence of the plastics industry, the food and drink brands, lobbying government, not wanting change. Well, let's go We're there We're back then. in the days of the tobacco Before industry. Before we talk about retailers, let's just go there with this pressing question that I have about economic growth and the economic model that has ultimately gotten it, us into the three biggest environmental issues of our time, climate breakdown, plastic pollution, loss of biodiversity, and how we are still looking at that classic economic model as we try to solve these environmental disasters staring mm -hmm. us in the face. Now, pie in the sky question, potentially, potentially a little bit naive of me, but again, as an individual, I'm thinking from experts like yourselves, do these conversations now have to be held where ultimately we don't prioritize economic growth over mm -hmm. the, the, the sheer future of our planet and yeah. our health and our survival. Yeah. Are those conversations happening at all? You would hope so. But every single retailer that we meet with, and obviously the retailers in the UK are very powerful, the supermarket brands have huge influence over the food and drink you know, conglomerates. And every single one of them, we know it's about money. So, you know, I know you, that we're going to talk a little bit about some of the projects that we've done, but what, just the North London supermarket that we, we worked with in the last few months, we did a 10-week project, really as a pilot to show we don't need to wait 10 years. What is all this? And what are we waiting for? There is no miracle material that's going to come out. We're never going to have a new plastic. Those days have gone. We have to turn this tap off really quick. So we did a 10-week project with a, um, Thornton's Budgeons up in Belsize Park, very affordable supermarket. This is not your Waitroses or your, or your M&Ss. In fact, they're the slowest. It was an affordable supermarket, so this wasn't about charging a premium. But we wanted to demonstrate how fast change could happen. And in 10 weeks, we had an amazing project director in there, lived there 24-7. We took nearly 2,000 product lines plastic-free in 10 weeks. And then we opened the doors, we announced to the press, and everybody came. What is amazing, though, is that already trade is up. And disproportionately, trade is up of the non-plastic product lines. Which, and and the, the feedback from these people, this is like a living, working lab. So our call-out has been to all the supermarket bosses, your M&Ss, who, who are one of the worst, I'm sorry to call them out, but the fact that they actually say to me, if only we could change the behavior of the wasteful consumer. <laughs> what? We buy. We buy what we are sold. Don't sell it to us. I didn't ask for this. Most people Neither here, I, I want to buy the thing inside. I don't want the plastic on the outside. <laughs> Sell it to me in a different way. Why is it taking so long? So our project was simply to demonstrate it can happen. It can happen fast. This is a living, working lab. That number is going to change in, in six months. That would double in six it's months. It's hugely important. It's such an example of what we believe, the perceived wisdom of all of this mess. It's a, it makes me think of the Scandinavian countries reducing uh, working week to four day weeks and their productivity goes soaring. You know, it, you have to ask that question. You know, what you're this, saying is there's a business opportunity here. Well, We're and, doing and, things and, differently. And, 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 and turning it upside that. down, taking a long, hard yeah. look at the mm. economic model to really fast tracks and solutions. David, what are your thoughts on, on that, the, the, the sticky subject of economic growth versus... I don't know. I mean, when, when, you, when you sort of... Well, I thought to myself... Oh, no, here she goes. Newman, don't rant. So I'm not... Go for it, go for it. I'm not going to rant here because I, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm going beyond my capacity to, to actually reason because the, it, it's into such a big picture that it becomes very, very complicated. Uh, what I would say to you is that there are good people around the world who are looking at alternatives. Um, as, as Richard said, uh, materials are not going to solve this problem of stuff going into the, into the oceans, but some materials, like the plastic-free materials, which Shan's shops are now adopting, 
compostable plastics, if they go into the compost, the food waste stream and get composted, can reduce some of the plastics that we're using for our food waste, food packaging. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, research going on into new materials being made from seaweeds and such like. You'll come we're to that, We're definitely going to come to all of uh, that. So, you know, there's, there's some good stuff going but on. Are, as, are they all as for the big picture, on economics? As for the know? big picture, are, are the millennials changing the way in which they're consuming? Yes, possibly they are. Uh, possibly, you know, young people don't get driving licenses anymore. They don't want to drive. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they are looking at their packaging. They're looking at the... They're not eating meat anymore. We you could know? inevitably so be heading towards a paradigm shift in just how we approach all of this, I how we choose right. to, to have a relationship with the planet. It could and be we'll get to that corner, now. Yeah. More aspirational stuff. But let's get into the retailers, biomaterials. We all have different, you know, varying thoughts, contrasting thoughts about it all. First of all, Sean, tell me about... You mentioned budgeons. What other retailers have you been working with around Europe that have really sort of been leading the way in making a change? Well, we, when we launched a Plastic Planet two years ago, and we were very inspired, you know, both involved in, in the launch of the film Plastic Ocean, um, and, and I, am, I am the least likely eco-warrior you'll ever meet. This is not my world. I'm an entrepreneur. You know, most recently I was, I was so far from a plastic stain. I was running an international skincare brand, pumping out those plastic bottles like no tomorrow. <laughs> Didn't really even think about it. And then I got involved in the launch of this film. I'm like, cheapest, what an epiphany for me. And then I realized, now I know, I'm never going to unknow this. How can I not get involved and use my entrepreneurial experience, really, to try and create change? And it has to be in a very human way, in a consumer-focused way. So myself and my co-founder, um, we were actually at, at one of the, the screenings of the, the film, A Plastic Ocean. And we were in the print shop, and we were looking at, the, oh, here's the bits of material we're going to hand out to everyone, because you can't make people scared by watching a film. Even like, you know, your amazing documentary, just everybody wants to cry when they see it. wasn't that. my intention to make <laughs> people scared. <laughs> it's because you cried so much. I'm would, so sorry. We all cry. But, but there's no point making people scared when they can't be part of the change. And so we were looking at these things, these three R's, and thinking, it's kind of nonsense. Because I know tomorrow I'm going to go to the supermarket. I'm going to push my trolley down. I'm going to fill it full of plastic because there is zero choice. And why in this world when we can buy wheat-free, gluten-free, everything free, why can't we buy plastic-free? This is like a human right has been taken from us. Now we know what plastic's doing. So we decided we would set up a different kind of organization that didn't just talk about the problem. I don't want to talk about the problem anymore. I am bored of hearing about the problem. Every ocean conference, surprise, it's even worse. We know <laughs> it's only going to get worse because we keep pumping it out. We have to stop. So our entire goal is to turn off the plastic So tap. tell me about these retailers that you've been so working with. So we started with. thinking, let's just ask the supermarkets. We're reasonable. Lie, we're not reasonable at all. <laughs> um, we're reasonable women. We just say, can we have a plastic-free aisle in all your 40 aisles where we could have the choice to buy plastic-free? You would think we were asking for moon dust. <laughs> Seriously. And we would have meetings with the top people of Asda and say, we've worked it out. It's 2% of your floor space. Maybe we could even just go and find the plastic-free stuff. Just to show you what we're talking about, you said you won't find 2% plastic free in our store. Have you just heard what you just said? You're telling me 98% of everything you sell is using plastic in some way. And that, that's just, that's typical of the reaction that we got. And then eventually, we meet this inspirational Dutch guy who owns 74 supermarkets in, uh, throughout Holland. And he said, I want to be the first. What do I have to do? And we worked with him. And in February, we opened the world's first plastic free aisle. And it used some controversial materials, because yes, they're compostable, and it's not perfect, but it's, a, it's one step down a different road, and that's what we have to do. We expect people to be plastic saints on day one. It isn't going to happen. Indeed. We're so, so deep into this, it's going to take a while. For the public, I didn't know what compostable meant, bioplastics, biomaterials. Uh, who would like to take this, David, Sean, or Richard? Well, he, he is yeah, Mr. Compostable. Tell me what, what is a bioplastic? That, I know you prefer to call it now compostable, but what is it? What is it made of? Okay, when you're looking at bioplastics, you're looking like plastics at a whole family of materials. So there's not one bioplastics, there are many bioplastics. There are bioplastics which are made with bio-based plant-like materials. There are bioplastics which are made with fossil fuel uh, feedstocks as well. And they're still called bioplastics. And they're called bioplastics because of what happens to them when you throw them away. What happens to them is they should biodegrade in a controlled time and space. 
This is where compostability comes in. So a compostable plastic will get collected with food waste, will collect with garden waste, will go to a compost facility, and in 90 to 180 days will rot down into CO2 and, and, and air, basically, and nothing else. Um, and they are designed to do that. And they can be made from starches, they can be made from sugars, they can also be made from fossil fuels, which, when you think about it, fossil fuels, in that sense, are just a very, very old plant-based feedstock, aren't they? Okay, so if you, if you design the polymers to actually break down and become composted, they must be non-toxic, they must be tested, blah, 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 so that when that material that they are composted with goes back to soil, it doesn't pollute. Now, compostable materials are not going to break down in the ocean. They were never designed to. They're not going to break down. They may eventually, but if you litter them on the side of the street, they're not going to they're not designed because to break down. What do there. they need? They need a high temperature. They need, they need a controlled environment. They need a warm, um, damp environment over a period of time to break down. So they can be composted at home or industrially? Both. There are both home and industrial compost, um, compostable materials, depending on who makes what. You can okay. buy home compostable, um, which can also industrially compost. You can buy industrial compost, which generally won't compost at home. Okay. What are the limitations when it comes to what composting facilities we have in the UK? We have, at the moment in the UK, over 200 different types of composting uh, plants, which can take, can take, or want to take, but can take these materials. The problem that we don't have in the UK is the collection system to get them from A to B. Well, I was wondering if you could get a show of it. hands in the audience yeah. of who's got collection of compostables at home. Anyone? Who, food, food who's, who's got it and who has Who's got collection of food? Who's, hands up if you've got it. You see, well, we, know, we know about 30 It is a minority. It's yes. about 30% 30, 30 of yeah. English households which, have food waste collection. Which is the madness to me. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, what, what was so interesting to me when I got involved in this space, and I went from, from running a beauty brand to visiting industrial composting sites. And actually, it's really fascinating Rock because for me, Poor it's girl. so... But no, it's so symbolic, though. I, I kind of love it because it's symbolic of a society. How we deal with our dirt is very symbolic of, of what we are as a society to me now. The fact that we actually thought it was okay, and still do, to send our plastic waste, cram it with nappies and all kinds of contaminated stuff, into a container, ship it off to a developing country. We're now sending it to Mozambique and Myanmar. Do not think we're dealing with our stuff on our soil. We're not. And say, oh, 100% recycled. That kind of, that's very symbolic to me. So when you look at all these things, what I find so fascinating as an entrepreneur is how disconnected everything is. Everybody looks at everything in a silo, ocean pollution, and then you look at alternative materials, perhaps to plastic, and then you look at waste management and our you know, highly inefficient system in the UK, and then you also look, hang on, over here, we've got deficient, hungry soils that DEFRA will also say, we've only got 100 harvests left in our soils, and yet 10% of our food waste in the UK is composted back into our soils. So here's a resource that we should be collecting, and we have already signed up to collect. We, we will all have um, nationwide food waste collection, so there'll be a home for these compostables to go by 2022. So we are now lobbying the government to say, bring this forward. Because even if you don't care about plastic packaging, care about the I soil. I can't help but think, again, as a consumer, we haven't figured out our waste collection and recycling for plastics. There's an option here for biomaterials compostables. We don't have the infrastructure to solve that. It well, well, makes me quite frustrated. I mean, you, but you, you, you said it yourself, David. You, you know, we've identified that most, and, and I'm not against compostables. I think they're a really key part of the answer. But most of the audience don't have at the moment the capacity at home to, 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 to utilise that waste stream. And you've said yourself that it isn't an answer to the problem of marine litter because that weren't designed to degrade in the ocean. So it's not. It's all about collection and keeping things in a closed yeah, I mean, loop. You know, whether, it, whether it's biological cycle via composting or, or whether it's going by a technical exactly. cycle via recycling, unless we can actually efficiently collect it, it's going to end up in the environment. And if some of exactly. these uh, materials, am I right to say there are chemicals in it, but, or are there not? In compostables, uh, are there chemicals compost, in Compostable the plastics are a biological chemical process. Biological. Yeah, yeah. So, so Stephanie, can I ask you if they're not collected properly and they end up in the sea and the temperature isn't high enough for it to biodegrade. Number one, the, the physical mechanical damage it can do to wildlife is comparable to plastic floating in the ocean right now. But as it sort of half breaks down and becomes smaller particles but isn't composted properly, what kind of concerns might you have with regards to that source of particles in the air we breathe and in our water? Um, 
but I, I don't know the exact ins and outs of the chemistry, but um, so the issue with plastic is that it breaks down, but those tiny, tiny particles are persistent. So no more than this solid particle that can have all kinds of different effects just due to that alone. But then, as I mentioned earlier, there's the chemical effects. And I don't know what chemicals are in bioplastics. I know there are additives because it has to have certain properties and antimicrobial properties and UV stabilizers and et cetera. So there will be additives present that will probably leach out just as they do in normal plastics. I just, I'm not actually sure of what it's, they so are. It's a whole other emerging area yeah. of yeah, what we I need to, so. to one, investigate. One, one interesting point that I learned the other day is because obviously there's a huge amount of focus on the oceans. And one of the American, uh, the German research labs has just come out to say that actually in our soil, we have between four and 23, I don't know why it's those specific numbers, but <laughs> four and 23 times as much plastic in our soil. And you know, you've, you're well, talking about the- just in this a study on compost and we've found three orders of magnitude higher. Yeah, and this in, is because in, yeah. we have very dirty uh, collection systems. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, you know, even those people here in the room who do have food waste or garden waste collection systems, you're not perfect. You put plastic in them. And so this plastic goes to the compost plant and ends up, as you say, on soil. Well, in addition to that, the, the small bits of plastic, we've talked about it from clothing that are going into the wastewater stream, the microbeads from cosmetics, when we had them there, are going to wastewater treatment. Many of them are being efficiently captured in the sewage sludge but then the sewage sludge is often returned to the land. Mm -hmm. So you've caught the plastic mm -hmm. and then you're putting it back there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in, in a way, it, it is the marine environment that's kind of brought us here to this topic. But, you know, forgive the pun, I actually think the quantity of plastic in the sea is really the tip of the iceberg in relation to the quantities of plastic that we buried in landfill, the quantities that we've perhaps unnecessarily incinerated, and the quantities we've ended up returning to, to soil. So I think there's a, there's a really is a big smoking gun about the plastic that we've got accumulating on land well, as very small feed. pieces. Right. E yes. e exactly. So, you know, to me, the, it's, it's a bit like one of those first aid courses when, you know, you, you go to this casualty and it's bleeding. Well, the sea is bleeding, yeah. but actually the danger is that the planet's heart is going to stop beating. Yeah. You okay. know, it's, it's about a systemic change in the way that we design, produce, and use yeah. plastic. I'm going needed. to come to you with, with, with that. I, I, yeah. It's very complicated. We are running out of time. I definitely want to have questions from the audience, and so I just want to come to sort of the solutions, even though I want to talk to you for another whole hour before we get to solutions. And ultimately, what this boils down to is that there's too much plastic being produced. We're not collecting it from the environment or recycling it. Of, of alternative materials, there's potential, and yet we, we don't have the infrastructure to use that properly, so it could contribute to the environmental issue. It, it's a big problem, but we know what we can do to solve it, right? Richard, when we first spoke on the phone, you talked to me about the tr there are a whole host of solutions, and we have to look at the trade-off between them. But if you were going to pick, I'm not going to say pick your favorite five, but you know, you're, the solutions that you think are the most urgent, and what trade-offs there might be, if any. And also, you mentioned myths. You know, we have to sort of debunk some of the myths when it comes to solutions. Could you give us an idea of where, where you think we need to go next? To, to me, the, the key challenge, and you know, you've got to recognize there isn't a silver bullet out there. You know, it, it, regrettably, you know, we can't just ditch plastic and move to a new wonder material. If you think of the four benefits that have made plastic so successful, one of them is its durability. You can rely on it, you can depend on it to do the job. You can rely on it to hold food or drink in a hot country, in a cold country, in the rain, in the sun. You know, so it's, it's a myth that you can imagine that the minute that plastic packaging falls into the environment, it can just disappear magically. And I think it's a myth to imagine we could replace plastic with another material that would have all of that functionality and durability but would disappear the instant that we wanted it to. So, so it's about managing it better, and there isn't a single silver bullet there. So what is needed, in my view, is, is the evidence to show us which, which are the plastic applications that we didn't need in the first place. And we know of some of them, you know, do I need a single-use plastic drinking straw for my children every time I get them a, a drink at the local pub? Of course I don't. Do I need a throwaway plastic carrier bag every time I go shopping? No, I need to get conditioned that if I'm going out shopping, I take a reusable bag with me. Whether it's plastic or not, I don't care. It needs to be as automatic as if I go out and the weather forecast says it's gonna rain, I take a raincoat. If I'm going out with the intent of shopping, I take a bag with me. 
So there are things where we can definitely reduce our use, and they're absolutely centre stage. They're, they're a priority. But beyond that, in my view, what we've got to do, and the compostables are absolutely part, part of it, you know, and if I think about a, a use in a, in a closed arena, in a football stadium, you've got the visitors there for a short period of time, lots of hamburgers being eaten, lots of wrappers around them, football managers in control of the supply of those hamburgers and the waste stream, the idea of bringing in compostables there so that the half-eaten hot dog and its wrapping could go into the same waste stream, perfect. But it doesn't work quite so well if the hamburger's being eaten out on the high street because you haven't got control of the waste management stream. So we need to link the solutions to the parts of the problem. Where do we bring in compostables? Where do we bring in material reduction? Where do we bring in recycling? Where, how do we deal with fibre emissions at, and where from tyres, where that comes during use? Because we're not going to be able to eliminate that, but the work that we've done shows that you know, some garments that you buy in the high street produce five times as many fibres every time you wash them than another comparable looking garment. So again, there's things that can be done at the design stage to design out the problem. But it's matching the specific solution to, to the particular aspect of the problem so that we don't end up, and the, you know, the classic example I'd bring out of a, a plastic solution that had unintended consequences are some of the biodegradables that merely disintegrate into millions and millions of fragments. And, you know, the example, as you well know, that, that I would pull out of my pocket yeah. would be a plastic carrier bag that I got in 2004. It sure. told me it was going to disappear after three years. After 14 years, it's just billions of small pieces of plastic. It seems <sighs> the solutions are there. That's, that's what keeps going around in my head. From this panel of experts, we have the solutions. We have, you have an implicit understanding of what needs to happen. How do we enforce those changes at the levels that they need to be enforced? How can each of us in this room help you to enforce them? And have there been any positive developments in that area? Write to your MP tomorrow and say you want a plastic tax. And you want that plastic tax ring-fenced and you want that money spent on ensuring that plastics are collected and safely disposed of. That's what you can do tomorrow morning. I just want to tell a, a little story of hope in this miserable, yes, in this miserable debate where we're all going to go and hang ourselves because it's all doom and, <laughs> doom and gloom. Um, and it is massively complicated, isn't it? And I have to think of things super simply because, you know, I'm a mum, I'm a shopper, yet I'm an entrepreneur, so I just want to think of things in a really simple way. Otherwise, nothing is going to change if we don't make it simple, which is why we have one goal. We don't talk about recycling, we don't talk about circular economies, we talk about turning off the tap. We need less plastic. So one thing that made me really quite happy and excited yesterday, after 12 months of trying, we finally got nearly 100 people in a room at Unilever. And Unilever are very open and honest, unlike many, um, that they put out into the world every single year 56 billion pieces of plastic in different shapes and sizes, 56 billion. 46 billion of those are the sachets that you saw everywhere in Indonesia. It's a huge part of their market. And just as you were saying, you don't want to take that from people, that they can buy their washing powder as and when they need it, rather than you know, as we would buy it here. Um, so we did a hackathon with Unilever, which was really exciting, uh, because it was the first time that Unilever, one of the biggest co companies in, in the world, and one of the most effective, really, in this whole area of sustainability, certainly in the talk, would actually sit in a room with people like ourselves at a Plastic Planet, lots of different mentors, um, to come up with ideas. And they put everybody into little teams and it was like a proper, you know, Dragon's Den type thing at the end, like Apprentice, actually, of people having to pitch. And the, and the final solution, they have committed to putting 100,000 euros behind it for a six month, really rapid project. And it's all about stopping those 46 billion sachets. And I'm with, I was thinking, why do they need us the ca to make this, to be a catalyst? To make, why are they not doing this anyway? But that's, so sh that, that's how the world is. Yeah. All these big companies are so busy just hitting that bottom line and doing their marketing and seeing how much more they can sell. This is not on their agendas. And the public, we have the power here. We have the power to vote with our wallets and with our voices and with our feet. We need to champion the brands that are trying to do things differently. They tend to be the small, nimble brands. You wouldn't launch a brand in plastic now. You've got to be mad to do that. Every supermarket buyer says, bring me something without plastic because I can't take the mail anymore. 
Because that's all they hear about is all the customers saying, when are you going to take the plastic off your fruit? When are you going to do this? We have to keep that up. And spread it to other countries yeah. who are not doing it. Yeah. 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 yeah, because what we do in the UK, and I'm sorry, we have no leadership here in the UK. 5p tax for a carrier bag, pathetic. No leadership there. You go to Rwanda, $37,000 fine or four years in prison for a plastic carrier bag. That's leadership. <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant. Stephanie, do you think that with the, uh, this is the final question, and then we're going to uh, put the questions out to the audience. Um, with the, the research that you're working on and the emerging uh, data on human health, are you seeing a shift in the support that you're getting to, to in order to research more and to get more evidence-based data? Um, I mean, we could do with more funding, if that's what you're asking, always. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm quite lucky in my position. I've just had two fellowships in a row, which is completely unheard of and ridiculous, but there you go. And I definitely think uh, funding bodies are more awake. So, for example, the National Environment Research Council put a call out for marine microplastics, um, and everyone's gone out from a European body. So, globally, the funding's coming through. It's probably still a bit behind in that it's focused mainly on the environment. There's a lot less out there in terms of government calls for health impacts. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously, I need more funding because, yeah, resources are, are limited. <laughs> how, how hopeful are you, are you feeling about this emerging so, science and well, how the research is being on faster? the radar. The, um, the medical, uh, chief medical officer in her report last year did highlight this as an issue of concern. Uh, so, fingers crossed, it's there. Um, I have no idea. We'll see. Yeah. I love those words. It's an issue of concern. Yeah, yes. we're no, concerned. Just, we're, yeah, we're maybe concerned. we should look into this. I think the tobacco industry maybe maybe said those kind of things. You yeah, said something really fascinating. Industry. Well, yes. not fascinating, just really fabulous. You know, it's going to take someone to sue the plastics industry for a human health issue, and then we'll see some changes. And it will happen. Yeah. And will, it will happen. There's already the first legal cases taken against the plastics industry for pollution. There already are. Okay. 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 And the liability of plastic producers in this, they know it. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Now, I know we're overrunning. If anybody has to run for trains, please go ahead. Um, but we're going to now um, get some questions from, from you. Thank you for your patience. I think we have microphones floating around somewhere. Yeah, we do. Okay, so let's start with this gentleman here in this row. Sorry about this. I knew we'd run over. Um. Stella McCartney has bla banned plastic straws from her private jet. <laughs> <laughs> How can we tap into people's concern about plastic so that it leads to wider concern about the impact that we're having on the planet, climate change, sustainability? That doesn't seem to be happening. Well, I think it's, I, a, it's, a really good, it's a really good question. I think that, you know, I mean, some would argue that our concern about plastics has potentially overtaken the concern that we should be having about other issues, about climate change, about carbon emissions. And, you know, as someone that works on plastic, I kind of say, well, uh, you know, there are a range of concerns and plastic is one of them and we should be addressing it. What, what I would like to see is a way that we can take that, uh, the way that the public has identified, thankfully, with the problem of plastics, and use that, and the fact that we are all talking about solutions here. There are solutions here. It isn't, it isn't compulsory that the, the oceans become contaminated with plastics. There are solutions there. What we need to do is to capitalize on people's passion for, for the ocean and use it to change the way we interact with plastics. But we need to try and piggyback on top of that and use it as a vehicle to communicate about some of the other problems that are less visible. So, so Don't you feel that's happening already, Richard? I, I think plastic is the gateway. Yeah. Yeah, it's the one we can blame nobody else for. Global warming is a little bit overwhelming for me. But plastic, I can see that. I can touch that. I know who to blame if for that. If we can solve plastics, we can yeah. solve climate change. The, the, the yeah, obstacles it's a to solving to, one, yeah. this yeah. environmental issue... I wouldn't say we can solve thing. climate change, but <laughs> we, I think had, that plastic know, is a gateway. We, 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 had a, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago here in London with, with a, you know, an audience, and, and, and we called it Everything is Connected. Soil, water, air, climate, plastics, they're all connected, mm, okay? And, and, and I, I concluded that by saying, we put a man on the moon 40 years ago, and by God, we actually brought him back. 
we can't solve the plastics problem. Yeah, we mm. can solve this. We, we, we just don't want Come to. Come on, also, we can do it. We definitely also can. Eight, eight percent of the global um, oil production goes into making plastics. So we're actually already contributing to part of the exactly. climate change issue. With forecast to be twenty percent. Yeah. Yeah. This young lady. There's a lady up the top row. there as well, Liz, somewhere. Good. We'll get to you. Promise. Hi. And the mic isn't on. I'm sure they'll try it again. Try again. Hello. There yeah, you right. go. Um, I was glad that you mentioned sort of right to your MP. Um, and I feel like a lot of the time when we end up talking about individuals, we sort of instantly use the word consumers and what can consumers do rather than citizens and how we can actually act as citizens. But do you think, and maybe this is one for Sean in particular, that there's a sort of in almost talking about what we can do as individuals and it's mm -hmm. take your plastic bag, take your own bags to the shop and it's, it's you know, use your own water bottle, whatever. Actually, that's a distraction and that there's a responsibility on behalf of the media, on behalf of all of us when we're talking about these things, that really we stop these things, which when we look at what's happening in other countries, when we look at where these conversations aren't happening, it's too little and it's too late, arguably. I know what you mean. It feels like I'm doing my little bit, but that, it's so overwhelming, it's not enough. But we all have to do our little bit. And I think the, the thing that we don't talk about nearly enough with plastic is the human health issue. So when you are doing your little bit and you're thinking, maybe I won't use cling film anymore for the marine environment, actually you're not using it for your own health. So the more we talk about health, we are such a selfish, selfish species, let's, let's admit it. A lot of people care about the ocean. A lot of people don't care about the ocean. They're very disconnected. They just care about having this easy life this disposable, on-the-go life that the convenience that plastic has afforded us all. When I think the human health message becomes much more well-known, I think next year will be a really big wake-up for all of us. I think that will be the year that people will start to actually change their habits. And it is just habit. It's like somebody was talking to me actually from um, RGS Hong Kong and we were talking about how one country banning carrier bags, what happened overnight it was just one, one day they could use plastic carry bags, and the next day they couldn't. Within two weeks, the habit was broken. And all we need is to change these habits, but we need more draconian laws. Even Kenya, it's, even Kenya, which is a very poor country, has banned plastic bags. Yeah, yeah. Chile. But how know, much, look at India. They're banning single-use plastic. Change, behavioral changes alone, though, won't solve this crisis. No, because we need legislation. There we go. Yeah, we, we absolutely have Write to have legislation. Write your letters to your MPs. Yeah. It really does make a difference. Right, well, lady, I, oh, go, when, ahead, when go ahead, go ahead. Oh, can I just mention one quick thing? Because no, I know people no, are leaving. Can't. You can't. <laughs> there is a, one quick thing. There is a letter that you yes. want to mention. We should I, have mentioned it, earlier. I don't know if any of you felt as guilty as I do when I talked about the fact we are now sending our plastic waste our rubbish, a rich developed country like ours, is sending our plastic waste to developed com com developing countries that cannot do with their own, let alone ours. We are writing a letter right now that we will have published in one of the big broadsheets any day. If anybody would like to sign this letter, it simply says we want to ban, an outright ban, on the export of our plastic waste to developing countries. Anybody wants to sign it, the letter is just out there, near where the drinks are. It helps. <laughs> so already... <laughs> already two things that you can do as well as changing your individual behaviors that I think makes me feel good to be able to sign that letter mm. to write another letter to my MP and also to continue changing my individual behavior that young lady at the top hi there thank you very much for such a fascinating evening for people who are part of small local grassroots programs that are trying to get their communities to be sort of plastic free communities what do you advise that we advise businesses for example you know there are as you say, compostable alternatives out there. But actually, if our local council, for example, doesn't do food waste collection, actually, mm -hmm. what is the best solution? What should we be saying is the best way to go forward? Okay, we've, we've just written to Michael Gove with a coalition of over, over 50 uh, companies and associations to ask for obligatory food waste collections throughout the UK in this new waste and strategy, the waste and resource strategy, which they will publish in the next few weeks. Again, you could write to your MP and you can say, God damn it, we want our food waste collected. That way we can also collect our compostable package with it and get it back to, to, to compost and get it back to soil. You, yeah, you pay your taxes. We pay for these services. Mm. All this plastic is produced in our name, as, as you say, not citizens, but consumers. The consumers want it. We need to be more vocal, perhaps a little bit more angry. It's only going to get worse.
Brilliant. Brilliant answers from both of you. Thank you. Um, a young lady there, and then I'll come to you next. Hi. Um, thank you so much for such an interesting and diverse uh, discussion this evening. Um, we had the pleasure of spending some time during the summer sailing around, learning a bit more about this, uh, this challenge. Um, and as a result of that, I had the pleasure of speaking to one of the larger food manufacturers. And I just wanted to share a bit of good news, because actually we do need good news to keep, keep us on on this, uh, this challenge, um, on solving this challenge. And that's that this is on their agenda. You know, they have been thinking about this for many years, yet they have not necessarily acted because there hasn't been the social media presence, there hasn't been the pressure. We need to keep talking about this and we need to make sure it's still present in the media because basically that is actually creating change. It's creating the pressure on these organizations to actually implement the solutions that they, are, they have in their R&D centers. Now that pressure is really, really important that the challenge is making sure that, that, that it's channeled in the right way and, and that the right decisions are made and that, that it's not the wrong decisions. It's not looking for low hanging fruit for quick gain and that, yeah, absolutely right. The pressure is really important. We need the evidence to guide industry and policy in the right direction to make sure we don't end up with unintended consequences. Yeah, it's, ta it's taken us, sorry, John, it's, ta it's taken us a long time uh, to, to get to this point, hasn't it? Because plastics have been around for 70 years. We can't allow it to take another 70 years before we solve no. it. So we've got, to, we've got to act today. A lot of those solutions are there, but it's the pressure and it's the pressure yeah. on the politicians, it's the pressure to make the industry hold up to its responsibility that's going to count in terms of the speed that we get those solutions out. Okay, yeah. I'm going to take two more questions. The young lady with the glasses, yeah. Is this working? Yeah. Okay, um, so this is a question to Sean. Um, I know you talked about Rwanda and the amazing changes that they've made. Um, which I think is something we should bear in mind. However, they have achieved that under dictatorship, and I wonder to what extent you agree with eco-fascism and what role that plays in this habitual change? I love that question. I love that question. <laughs> I, I, I have an unusual belief that I think China is going to save the world because they don't have this pesky little thing called democracy there. And they, <laughs> and they have decided, they have decided there will be a new China, and new China will be clean and it will be green. And I think, you know, with the void that Trump has left in America, where, um, you know, we don't need to go there. Um, <laughs> but I think China is actually going to show us a real way. And actually, no, the, the Rwanda one is interesting because I did a podcast with the woman that made that happen in Rwanda. And she said that she, was, she went to every single committee meeting. Every six months, they talk about what they're going to do about, about the plastic carrier bags. And in the end, she said, I am taking this away from you because you are making no decisions. Whatever I say, this is what we're going to do now. And she banned it overnight. So she, she's like a saint in Rwanda. So it wasn't really because of the, the eco-fascist dictatorship of Rwanda. It was actually one single one woman. Single yeah, woman. And if you, that, that's, if you, But look at India. India has got a statement, I think it's Andhra Pradesh, where they have declared it to be a, the, the, green, the green model for India. And, and that, you know, that's in a democracy and where they have all this stuff with, with recycling and with compostables and with green energy, etc. You don't need a, a dictatorship to do it. We don't you need, need strong a dictatorship government. because I was going to um, ask Shan if she would take up the baton. In <laughs> Damn it. I'm in. Are you, are you in? I'm are in. you in? We could do a lot no, no. worse, ladies and gentlemen. She's, she's the vice president. Oh. <laughs> what about Richard? The problem is, I mean, it's easy to ban a single-use plastic carrier bag that we didn't need in the first place. But yeah. I actually don't agree that we can legislate against all of our uses of plastic. No, no. I don't Agreed. see that as the answer. I think one of the reasons that we're in this pickle is that we've been given plastics for convenience to use for a few seconds and then discard without caring about it. And with that kind of pedigree, all of my lifetime I've been brought up with that. It doesn't surprise me that some of it ends up being littered. Mm. It, it's disposed of because we don't regard it as a value. It's something that we can throw away. And, and we've got to try to reverse that. We've got to find ways to change behaviours that don't involve slamming a tax on everything or banning everything. It, it needs to be almost as automatic as if when we all stop talking, you go out of this room and you go to the bathroom, you see the hot tap running, most of you will turn it off. Why? Because you understand immediately that there's a waste, you know immediately how to intervene, you will turn off the tap. 
and you also know that your intervention will be 100% successful. We need to make our use of plastics where we need them as simple and as understandable as that, that we know how to intervene, and we know that if we do intervene, that intervention will be successful. And it's about the value that you talked about at the beginning, David. There will be some uses where we need plastic, but we need to make sure we've got ways of using them responsibly. Very good point. Very good point. Thank you. One final... <laughs> One final question from the gentleman. Hello. Yes. Uh, my name's Stuart. I'm working for a startup called Recircle Recycling, which is a, a household or workplace uh, circular economy idea. So you mentioned the recycling myth er earlier, and you're talking about how most of our stuff is not recycled at all. It's, if, it's, if it's recycled, it's downcycled. What do you think the chances are that the existing recycling system will achieve a circular economy or a closed loop? Can it ever? Well, you know, I would have said that 20 years ago it was impossible a black man would become president of the United States. So everything is possible. I think under the, the regime which we live in today, and I don't mean the government regime, but under the, the economic regime we live in today, that's not going to happen anytime soon unless we make dramatic changes. And unfortunately, much as Richard, I love his pragmatism and his reasonableness, but we do need laws. We, we need heavy taxation on the wrong use of a material. For I me, say we don't need any. But I'm saying you can't solve the whole problem with laws and with bans. Yeah, but with industry, and you know, like yourself, I speak to industry every single day, and they don't want to change. This is so inconvenient for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your patience and for sticking with us way over time. Please, could we have a warm round of applause for our wonderful panel? Oh, I'm well done. Well done.